Uh, with year number five, I think you've been involved in every single one of them. Uh, for those of you, uh, so those of the people who are not aware of you are, just say a little bit about your company because it really started off from the humblest of humblest of origins. There was just, just you and maybe one other person, but now you're up to where? And tell us a bit about the company. Okay, uh, uh, we started in the Meet Centre, 1999, uh, two employees. Uh, we currently have a group of companies that employ... That, that building was a, big, was a big hall then, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, so uh, we had to build a wall to actually reclaim the first space we worked in. Uh, there was still uh, tennis court markings on the floor when we moved in, uh, and gravel car park that I nearly lost my car in once. So uh, it's now a state-of-the-art enterprise centre. So, so you had a dream? We had a dream. Uh, we got started, uh, many bumps on the road. Um, but you know, today we have a group of companies uh, employing 340 people. Um, we're still headquartered in the enterprise uh, centre. Um, and what I say to people is uh, we're only getting started. Um, and there are, we have big plans for where we want to go. So we have, we have three companies at the moment. One food company based in Navan. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a contract pet uh, food manufacturing company based in Longford. Um, and we have an online uh, fulfillment company based in Dublin. And exporting to where now? Because I know you're, you're doing a lot of dairy products, a lot of food products. Yeah, um, we're exporting obviously uh, Ireland, UK, but um, main markets are in Scandinavia, Western Europe, um, Eastern Europe, North Africa, uh, West Africa, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, we're heading into the USA hopefully yeah. soon. Um, a little bit into, um, and we are trying to crack China, but as I said, we've talked about that many, many times. And, we, we, we're going to crack China this year. Yeah, good stuff. So that's John Cunningham started off with just himself and another person, wasn't it, when you started? Yeah, two of us. Now up to 300 and exporting all around the world. So keep that in your mind. Michael, you're one of those people from Enterprise Ireland that makes things happen for Ireland Inc. Okay. and driving companies, driving enterprise. Tell us a bit what's happening from, I suppose, from the, the macro level in government, where you're driving, uh, I suppose, thoughts, inspiration, funding into the regions. So, just to place it in, in context, I mean, I, I look after two regions within Ireland, the, the Midlands and the Mideast, and so there's seven counties. And when we're looking at the regional development agenda within those counties, uh, the only place that we can actually get jobs from are from the companies that we have as clients. And that's, uh, so you can only see jobs uh, generated from existing companies or new startup companies. So like those young people that are here today with all those wonderful ideas and those products that they've got, this too can be part of your journey down the years. You know, so because the system that's there at the moment in terms of the support for entrepreneurs is much more developed than it was back when John was, uh, was starting life. So I would, I would argue that the, you know, the, the first point of call for all entrepreneurs should be the local enterprise office. That's where you can get the general uh, advice and guidance. That's where you can get financial support. It is, it is also where you can get onto the track where if you are the right kind of company, you can end up in the portfolio of Enterprise Ireland. So just to come back to the question that you're asking about sort of the macro level sort of uh, strategy, I suppose, we all take our P's and Q's from the Government 2040 plan. Yeah. And, Where's that going, Michael? What's and, that about? And that's an extremely ambitious plan that's charting out how this country is going to develop over the next 20 years. And it's also going to decide where we're going to invest our money, uh, in what areas, in what kind of projects, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, the population of this country, at a minimum, is going to increase by more than a million, 1.3 million, so what, what people say. Okay. Only a further couple of hundred thousand, 300,000 are likely to be uh, living and working in the Dublin area. The rest have to be distributed around the country. And so what this plan is about is trying to sort of build that infrastructure around the country. And Michael, when you look at county needs, sectors, sector specific for this county, where are the strengths here? Well, a huge strength in county Mead is in the whole food area. Yeah. It's almost synonymous with food. I mean, even when we were kids, uh, we all knew about Boyne Valley honey. Uh, so it was in the, the mindset about Boyne Valley and food. And it's a tradition that's here, uh, you know, that goes back, uh, somewhat estimate, maybe 10,000 years, where the, 
you know, they've discovered bog butter, you know, that has yeah. very, very ancient roots and all of that kind of thing. And that's reflected today in major investments by companies like Devonish Nutrition who are setting up a global food innovation center in County Meath. A lot of that uh, attractiveness of and the openness of County Meath to, to, to welcome in Devonish, uh, you know, is down to the local authority and the organizations like Gary and people like John who are opening doors and all that kind of stuff. It seems to me that John's company in the Devonish, is, they're, they're the new Glambias and the new Kerry groups Absol because we don't absolutely. have many multinationals that, that are actually scaled up, That's like right. Sobrian here, but yeah. you have these two companies coming from this county. So our multinationals, our Irish-owned, homegrown multinationals, the majority of them are in the food sector. Yeah. Yeah. And so the big agenda with food is, it's everything from the sustainability of that production, which is a topic that John and I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about, and how do we crack that issue, right back to the farm. Uh, so Enterprise Ireland would be involved with the National Ploughing Championships and there we're showcasing innovations in the engineering sector that are helping farmers to be more, uh, you know, environmentally friendly, to, to be more proficient and all that kind of stuff. And the issue that we're dealing with here in County Mead is this, how do we build companies of scale in the food sector f by design? So we call it scalability by design. And so that's where you, you sit down and you put in place a plan that will enable your company to be a scalable entity in the future. Sometimes when you start real small and you're trying to cross that chasm to be in a large company, it's extremely difficult. There's lots of different I'm things interested that I'll talk to you about that later on because we had Connor Cogan earlier on who was yeah. talking about scaling and, and, yeah. and the challenge of that and John has gone through it. Paul McCall, uh, your Chief Executive of Meath County Chamber. Um, People need to be in your organization, don't they? Let's, put, let's be blunt here. Uh, I, I'm involved in the County Kildare Chamber, and I'm in a hub that they've produced. And, and this is what, you, what you're doing. This is what you're going to be supporting companies on. Yeah, uh, County Meath Chamber is a relatively new entity. Um, Meath had many very well-functioning chambers. Um, and in 2016, the, I suppose the decision was made to amalgamate those into one county brand. Um, I suppose the, the premise behind that is that with one voice, you're, 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 you have a, a better presence and a better unified uh, presence. And the whole idea of chambers is to connect and support. So it was about bringing, pooling uh, the chambers, pooling the talent, pooling the resources, and giving the businesses, ultimately, which is the backbone of any chamber, as you rightly said, the opportunity to feed off each other, to learn off each other, to, to identify uh, each other's pitfalls and, um, and to, to rise. One thing I found is, um, again, using my own example where I live, the multinationals, the large companies, love to see a strong chamber because they see organization, they see strength, they see opportunities to network, they see opportunities to do business with small companies. Uh, and I find that more and more as I'm going around trying to, I suppose, uh, reach every part of the county yeah. and to attract all types and sizes and scales of business, uh, I'm definitely finding and hearing that from the corporates especially, that they, um, they, they sort of expect it. It's happening in other counties. Uh, Kildare, as you rightly said, um, took the step to amalgamate their chambers. It took um, almost 10 years to do, but they're there. and. Um, and it's 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 trying to suppose replicate what they've done and um, and in America chambers are so so well respected and with the, with more and more multinationals in this county that have, have bases they, they sort of expect and it. And you provide opportunities to network for people to meet yeah. and do business together? Yeah, yeah, so we have a full calendar of events and um, different opportunities to network uh, to, and then training courses and linking in with the our key stakeholders, which would be the LEOs and Enterprise Ireland, and Mead County Council, and Mead Enterprise, etc., 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 to try and, um, I suppose, collaborate rather than us all operating at different, um, at different levels, pulling it all together, I suppose, and providing the best service for business. David Downs, um, you're doing business with the county UMAC, and what I, I'd like is you're the other side of the scale to John here. You're small, you're adaptable, you're flexible. Uh, but you're growing and you hope to one day get to where the, the, the John Cunninghams and the Epicons of the world are. Absolutely, yeah. Tell us yeah. about UMAC, what is it? So UMAC is a, we're a, an industrial software development company. 
So we buy electronics from various different sources and we develop software for various applications, be it water, wastewater treatment plants, utility facilities, factory, factory environment stuff. How long are you in business? So four years. Four years. What's that journey been like? We heard Connor's, uh, the bearded man's uh, uh, journey and I suppose there's, there's pitfalls, but he's learning from his mistakes. Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, I can I could relate to what Connor was describing earlier because um, I started from the back, the back bedroom in the house. Yeah. It got out of hand when the couriers were queuing up outside the door, so uh, we had to move on at that point. So we are currently in uh, in the tech hub in Kells. So okay. we have six. How's that going for you? Super, super. We have six employees. There's plenty of space. There's fast internet, ample parking. It's a, it's, it's, it's a good environment. It's a good environment for small companies like ours to, 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 to grow and develop. But you also have people working elsewhere? We have. We have an office in Tralee. Uh, we've just recently set up an office in Warrington in England and we're looking to recruit over there. So in terms of, in terms of development and growing, I guess there's the... Uh, where John has had his dream, I'm still dreaming. So trying to, trying to find, trying to work our way through that. Managing people who are working remotely is, is quite a difficult thing to do. I try to speak to everybody twice a day and two conversations with each person each day, listening to their problems, trying to deal with those problems. It's very difficult then to, to get the nine to five job done as well. So yeah, in that, uh, that, that growth path, I mean, we now look, we need to put additional skill sets in place whereby it relieves me of doing some of those. Yeah. Still okay. want to make those phone calls, but I don't necessarily want to make the phone calls and have a list of five or six things to do for everybody. And is there someone that you can go to if you hit a brick wall or you find a challenge that you find tough to overcome? Do you well, want to I, or do you have someone you can I guess we, we, we in, in an unofficial capacity, uh, we're not involved in any, any, any of the official mentoring uh, programs, but certainly over the years from being involved in different organizations, working with some of the embassies throughout the city. Um, the, the, the Chambers, Paul and her team, Gary and uh, his team arrange events. So it's, you know, we, we can get out, we can meet people, we can talk to people, we yeah. can bounce ideas off one another. And it's, um, look, I, I guess it's it, networking. It's the cross fertilization of ignorance sometimes is, is the way it's been described, but it also, uh, you know, we, we, in those conversations, you do meet people who, who are going through what you're going through, but people who have been through what we've been through. Yeah. Louise French, you're running EO Ireland. Please explain. So EO is, uh, means Entrepreneurs' Organisation. Uh, it's a global network of entrepreneurs, chapters across 57 countries. There's 180 chapters of 13,000 members. EO Ireland is uh, founded in 2013. We're touching 50 members now. Um, what do they do? What are you doing with them? Well, our vision, um, the EO vision, is to engage leading entrepreneurs to learn and grow. So it's a um, an organisation to. One second, um, one second. Um, can we get some hush, please? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Louise. No problem. Uh, it's an organisation that provides peer-to-peer um, -peer learning and support, connection to experts and once-in-a-lifetime experiences and that's how our members uh, really do learn and grow. Uh, our main benefit is what's called Forum. Forum is where a group of seven to ten non-conflicting members, when I say non-conflicting, they don't share the same industry, they won't be related to each other, they won't be customers of each other, will meet monthly and have a very structured meeting uh, and it's around personal development, business development, and it's all experience sharing in a very safe, non-judgmental uh, environment. There's an accelerator program you want to talk about because that's, that sounds to me like a no-brainer. People need to get involved in that. What sure. is that? Yeah, so the accelerator program <coughs> was launched here just in last month, October 2018, uh, in, in, in conjunction with and partnered with Media Enterprise that was held in Cal's Tech there. Uh, it is a program that um, brings businesses from about 250,000 up over the million mark in a very short period of time. It's a 24 month program. It covers four main principles, which is cash, strategy, people and execution. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's delivered by a trained facilitator. Uh, it's used as a toolkit and following each learning day, which happens quarterly, there's accountability sessions which are coached by an EO member. So it's all volunteer CEOs of very large companies that are our EO members, 
coaching these smaller businesses. Has anything come across yet, Louise, where you mentioned about cash and strategy and people and all that kind of stuff? Already, have you seen common challenges that companies are facing that your mentors are having to solve or trying to help solve? Yeah, so like I say, we have just launched, so we, ha we had our first uh, day, which was our strategy day, and we believe that was the best module to begin on, yeah. you know, strategy being a core kind of principle of any business. So the accountability sessions are actually happening this month, so they happen monthly. So we're, we're kind of awaiting feedback now. I know John had his yeah. last night in Limerick, and he was, he was pretty uh, energized by it himself. You know, obviously he is coaching the session uh, with, the, with the accelerators, but you know, there's real great learning between all, right. regardless of the business. You know, there's, there's, this experience sharing is just huge, hugely powerful. So John, as if you had enough to be doing, you're, you're now a mentor and a coach, and you're traveling the country helping companies. Yeah. What kind of companies are you meeting, and what, what, is their, what are their problems? That, are they very simple things, or are they complicated? What's happening out there that you're finding need solving? Um, yeah, so um, I, I suffer from serial volunteerism. Yes. Yeah, so it used to be GAA, but my, my kids got through that, so now I'm at, on the business. So I, um, yeah, I'm involved in, um, I'm a member of EO, I'm chair of Accelerator, I'm a mentor on Accelerator. Um, and so I, I'm mentoring three companies uh, in Limerick. Um, and again, the, the big thing I see is when you ask people, um, and I, I did a BNI session yesterday morning, and someone said to me about this race to the bottom on price. Everything is about price. There's no margin left in the business. Uh, small companies are, are getting killed uh, competing against the big companies. Uh, and really, uh, what we've learned is that if, if, as a small company, you have to be different. Um, but when you ask people, what is it that makes you different? Like, what is your strategy? Most of them don't know. Their, their strategy at the minute is survival. 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 Keep cash flow. Keep it. Keep keep the head down. Hopefully, we'll get through this month, and maybe we'll get a chance. Maybe we'll get our head up. Um, so what you what what I find across a lot of the small companies is that the main person in there is working 70 hours a week. Um, they are pulling a very modest salary, if any, out of the business. Uh, they can't hire help, um, and they're stuck in that place now. Uh, for them, I suppose what we uh, is, is we stop the clock for a few hours and we say, hang on a sec, what, what is it that makes you different? Uh, we were given a key line on, in, this, in the strategy day when we, we launched last month was that what, what makes you different is what you get paid for. Okay. Um, so it's that, like against the race to the bottom, it's how I can actually charge a proper price. Yes. So you have to focus in on what makes you different. Um, if, if you're only trying to do the same as somebody else, you have to be cheaper to be successful yeah. in the long term. But if you want to have a small business that's successful and will pay you a decent margin to, to, you know, for, your, for your, your work, you have to do something different. Some people call it value add, but, you have to, but to do that, you have to identify it. It's not going to happen on your plate. You do need to sit down and identify that. Um, and what I'm finding across most of the small businesses is that they are surviving but they're not thriving. So that Passover, some do, but that Passover from a small company to a mid-sized company will not happen without a decent strategy. John, to make that leap, um, okay, so we have to be different. Yes. But to make that leap, is, is, is it down to a simple strategy? Is it opposed to, is, is it like, what is it? Is it oh, we need more money to fund the company no, so no. I can get out above and do other stuff? Or? No, it's not, it's, 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 what are you finding? Everybody wants it to be about money. Yeah. But, you know, again, even as Joe said, like money is okay once you have a strategy, but pouring money into a failed strategy is just a waste. But you will find when you look at these companies, if you say, if you say to a company a simple thing like, uh, who are your last 10 customers that you got? The last 10 transactions you did as a business. Okay. Which of those fit what you want to do? You'll probably find only three. Seven are because I need to pay the bills. But, but which of them do you want to do? And are you getting paid more to do that? And you'll find that you probably are. And why? I never thought about that. And then how does that define who your customer should be and then you start to focus instead of saying, I'm going to take the business that comes at me, is that I'm going to start to steer my business in the direction of business I should be doing with customers who value what I do, who are going to pay me slightly above the odds to do it. And I'm sure people do recognize the fact that you, know, you, you do have probably a lot of smaller companies who are your customers, they're probably tortured to deal with. Yes. And, and they absolutely wreck 60% of your time yes. and wreck your head. 
So what do you get rid of them? Is it? Well, you get rid of them. Uh, everybody, you have to practice. So yeah. you, you got to pay the bills when you got to pay the bills. Uh, even I have to pay the bills when I got to pay the bills. But the question is, if you had a choice about swapping out one of the customers you don't want for one of the ones you do, who, what type of customer is that? And then you kind of go, well, and most people don't think about that. They think they're lucky to have the three good customers and really unlucky to have the seven terrible ones. And all I'm saying is that part, and this is what strategy is about, and it, it helps you to identify what it is that makes you special. And then that becomes your accelerator pitch. This is what makes me special. Yeah. And then you identify the customers that will pay you for being special, and then you change where you're going as a company. David, you're taking this on board. Because you're, you're young, you're six, six employees. Yeah. Are you finding that as well? Are you finding those challenges? You've got a torturous customers giving you a desperate grief for small money, but the money is paying a few bills. And, and are, are you strategizing? How are you, uh, have you a pathway lay, laid out in front of you? I guess, look, starting off on day one, you take work from wherever you can get it. You can take orders from wherever you can get it. You have to, and, and you know, part of that is the learning experience because you do end up dealing with the, the people you may not necessarily want to deal with, your ideal, your ideal client, but it helps you form a picture of that ideal client, and it helps you advance and move on. So, yeah, sure, even now today, we, 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 have, we have customers, we have good customers, we have one exceptionally good customer uh, who creates a considerable amount of grief, but we're also becoming a little bit more robust as we age. Are you able to push back on them? We're able it? to push back on them. Not only push back, but we, we, we push back, but we bring something to the table positive. as well, positive to the table, which effectively allows us then to, it, it, it broadens, and I'm, I'm specifically, I've got, I've got this one customer in mind because it's something that we're working on at the moment. It broadens our, 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 our depth and breadth of our ability for that client and effectively increases our value proposition. So we're, we can increase revenues. What we need to do is both sides of the table have to put manners on one another, I think. Yeah. And, that's, and that's, that's what's important. But it, it's about communication. So you can, it's not what you say. I think in many respects it's how you say it. But there are definitely clients who um, will be passing off onto our competitors because okay. they'll, they'll deal with them. And Paula, we heard about the race to the bottom on price and, and, and cash flow. It's always a devil to, to, to keep on top of and keep yourself going. Even company owners uh, to, uh, like the likes of these people out here are trying to survive and even pay themselves. You know, we have to pay the employees first, really. Are you finding that challenge and, and are, are, how are your members getting around it or over it? Yeah, um, well, I suppose to an extent and depending on, on the new, if it's a new startup, etc. I suppose we've got a, 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 a broad range of business sizes, as I meant, previously mentioned. They all have problems with cash flow. It's a very, very tough econ economy and a very tough time. Uh, obviously, we have uh, the likes of all the concerns around Brexit and I know we're, 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 there's breakthrough and then there's a step back and we won't know what way that's going to pan out. An awful lot of um, an awful lot of fear around the uh, around fluctuations, and I mean it's very hard to manage cash flow with all of that um, in the in looming. But I, I find it, you know, what we have people like David here is it, who's in our network, and then John and the, and the scale and the and the the expertise, and I just find that, you know, having this level of expertise is so it's at such huge benefit to, to the smaller business because to be able to, you, you think you have, you're the only person who has the problem. So small businesses aren't trying to keep their heads down and just keep plowing on and keep working and I find this fascinating as David describes, you know, you take your orders from anywhere. I mean, the chamber in one sense is a startup as well. We're, we're muddy and getting ourselves through that muddy water too. But, but definitely, as you, as the more you talk, the more you, the more you share, the more you ask for help, the more you sort of uh, try and take off the, the, the pretense that you know everything and ask for help. You definitely, there's where you find the answers. Yeah. And when it comes to stuff like managing finance, and I mean, there's all sorts of courses and there's all sorts of help, and we can tap into resources everywhere. But the business to business element is where where you really get the answers. Yeah, the Senate program is it ha, has huge potential if you're scaling up and hoping okay. to reach that there, but. but that that comes in at every level. Yeah. yeah. No, but certainly I find my own example, uh, I would use the Kildare Chamber quite a lot. 
and they have regular meetings, Wednesday morning meetings. Yeah. But I found now is, especially the smallies, the smaller enterprises are now mucking in together and having their own lunches and having their own little powwows and little thought processes going on. So it does seem to be working. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you're, no man's an island really, or no woman's an island. You, you can't survive on your own, can you? No, we find it, like we, we put on, we've got our monthly meetings, we've got a calendar of events. It's easy to, it's easy to plan a calendar of events. It, the hard bit is to get the, the client engagement. Um, one thing I find personally, like coming from private business before working, and I worked in tourism before this, and me the tourism, and, and now here, the biggest thing that people hate you for, resist, is if you waste their time, so if you put on something and you bring them in on the pretense they're going to get something, you've wasted their time because they physically have had to leave their business and come in and, and possibly lose the sale. Um, definitely, we're, we're sort of continually researching what time suits. Is it 8 o'clock? Is it 7 o'clock? Yeah. Is it 6 o'clock? Like, I mean, there's all the times vary in every, in every county, but definitely um, finding the right match is the most important thing. Um, last night, the Business and Tourism uh, the business and tourism Awards for me, they're on next week, and last night, the pitch night was on, and um, I was keeping an eye on it uh, for new potential businesses for the Chamber and people who we could engage. And, the big, the big thing I was shocked at were the were the age of some of the young entrepreneurs. I know. I mean, how young? I mean, there's a young entrepreneurs category in the Business and Tourism Awards this year, and the guys are not. Some of them might even be starting college. I mean, possibly some students who have um, business, new business ideas, yeah. and um, their potential new members for our chamber, their potential new uh, candidates for accelerators down the line. But. But more and more, they are the, 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 the future of me, I suppose, yeah. you know, and, and that's where they, they learn and, and, um, and learn off each other. And Louise, you're an international organisation come into Ireland recently. Are they finding the same problems and challenges, your mentors, when they're going out there? And, and actually, another thing, how many mentors do you have now and who's available to mentor these people and, and, and join your organisation? Yeah, so we have... It's, it's, oh. it's, not an, it's not an elitist bunch. No, not at all. Yeah. And not at all. There's actually no egos in EO because everybody's open to learning, it's a very open mind approach. So you don't get that sense, that nobody, no entrepreneur feels that they're better than anybody else in the room. So it's a, it's a great grounded uh, group of members. Obviously within that group, there is those who put their hand up to be involved in the Accelerator program chaired by John. Uh, so we have 10 accountability coaches at the moment. We currently have six groups. So you actually so have an oversupply. accountability coaches, what are they again? So they're, are they members, CEOs? Yeah, they're CEO members of EO who will coach these smaller businesses, our accelerators, through the two-year program. So apart from our quarterly learning days on the four modules, cash, strategy, execution, and people, there is monthly accountability sessions. So the CEO member will sit with the accelerators so you and have your own personal chairman. Absolutely. You have to, yeah. your account, the owner is accountable to somebody. Yeah. Absolutely. Not well, just their partner so when they're not bringing the money in, but there's somebody they can talk to. Yeah, and the, I mean they're accountable to themselves. So yeah. pretty much what the, the, the volunteer member is doing is is facilitating a session whereby you know all the, the, the these four modules are, are worked through over the course of the program, and you get to pretty much share experiences with your peers. And, and talk through where you want to go to next, like where, where, where is your business going and working through that on a monthly basis and having a set of tasks that the accelerator will go away with, will come back the following month, the coach will say, right, what have you done here now and, and, and let's work through it. So it is, it's, it's very structured it's, it's, um, and, and it wouldn't happen without yeah. the member. I mean, it, it, the member is the key part to this, that they keep the session going and moderate it. Very so well as well. I find this interesting because if I could turn again, and, and, and I haven't forgotten you, Michael, because I have something to ask you as well there. The two business people, again, that, have, that are running companies, who, who are you accountable to? Uh, do, do you talk to someone that is demanding your, uh, even though they're, they're not part of your company, but they're demanding you to perform, they're demanding results? David, is there someone that you're accountable to? I mean, you're, you're the top dog in your company. Well, I don't have... No, no. We, ex externally, we don't have anybody to uh, th that we're accountable to. I certainly draw Would on... Would it help push you, do you think? Sorry? Would it help push you? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's important to have... Because, look, it's all about focus. It, it, it's trying to get up in the morning and, and, and stay focused on, on, on what you've got to do for the day. But by 9.15... You've been distracted by so many other things. So yeah. if you know that if you know that you've got somebody at the end of the week who's going to be on your back about maybe not delivering on something that's uh, yeah. that, that's important. But we, I do around me. I do have a team of people who are infinitely better at, at what I do than I am. So um, it's it's having those conversations yeah. with them. You know, we, we do have our 
are things to do, but there are there are elements of the daily uh, the yeah. daily grind that do slip through okay. the uh, they slip through the cracks. And John, you're traveling a lot. You know, again, a very big operation. How do you re retain and maintain your focus? Uh, well, um, uh, a lot going on. Yeah, I'm a member of the O. Uh, so, um, as Louise is saying, uh, we meet every month uh, for four hours. So it's like a, a high-level um, chair of chairs, as it were. Uh, seven other seven other CEOs, um, and uh, we we have we update each other uh, about you know where everything is. We talk about this four percent the whole time. What's uh, that? The four percent that you can't say out loud because it's too scary. Um, Cash is usually up there at the top, uh, or, or, or liquidity, but also about uh, personal stress and strain, uh, motivation, uh, all these kind of things. Because you know everybody looks at me and and, and they say like you know well, John's got it sorted. Uh, you know he's obviously sure where he's going. And yes, while well, I was saying to somebody earlier, you know when you're representing the business, you have your Superman outfit on, yeah, and everything is hunky dory. Are you paddling furiously under the water? <laughs> But, but, you know, you go away yourself, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and what, what do you recharge off? Because, yes, when you're pitching and selling for your company, you're not just representing yourself, you're representing everybody in your company. Um, and then you have to go away and, and get a sounding board that recharges you to, so that you can go again. So uh, I use EO. It's, it's an amazing uh, organization. Um, um, and that sort of learning from other people that are you know, different industries, different places. Some people are 10 years ahead of you, some years are 10 years behind you. So that, that's my sounding board. So Michael, do these people inspire you? Do you see what's going on here? And then you're supporting these kind of companies. We are, we are indeed, and uh, a lot of what has been said here is strikes a chord with us. Uh, so even on that issue that you were talking about there, about, you know, who are you accountable to? Yeah. In, in Enterprise Ireland, we would always advise, and in some cases, when we're putting money into companies, we would insist on uh, companies setting up formal boards, proper chairman uh, from the outside, and all of that kind of stuff. But also, we would advise uh, entrepreneurs and uh, chief executives to, you, you need somebody that you trust, that you can go to, and as John says, you explore this four percent of stuff that you don't want to talk about to anybody in the open and that's very important because you've got to be able to let that steam off and it's a it's a real uh, exciting development to see EO coming to Ireland and to see the accelerator network starting here in County Meath which that, well. oh we absolutely need this we need um, people don't believe us but the biggest feedback that we get from companies, whether they're small startup entrepreneurs or whether they're big companies, the biggest feedback we get is the learning, the development, the networks that we have access to. All of that is hugely valuable, even more valuable than the money. Uh, but the money is important. Uh, as Louise says, like without the cash uh, to drive your business forward, you're not going anywhere. But that cash has to come in reality from that customer engagement, selling customers high value product, and that thing that John was speaking about really strikes a chord with us. Okay. Um, I want to get questions from the audience, but Michael, I've, you can ask one more question first, so I want someone to ask a question now after this. Michael, at what level then are Enterprise Ireland going into a young company or a startup? or you know, it could be a medium-sized company that's in operation 10 years. Is there a level of turnover? Is there, do you look for a certain type of profitability before you go in? Because I'm interested in the fact that you demand to have a board on board, yeah. uh, your, your clients, who you, you demand they have a chairperson. Is there, is there a level of what you look for? Well, um, so we, we're in cahoots with the, with the local enterprise office in yeah, every okay. county, and, and they're the front of house, if you like. Uh, but uh, we're also quite involved in very early stage. So, give you an example, we, we have a program that we run through the Institutes of Technology, it's called New Frontiers. So, young people, older people come in and talk to us about their ideas, and we put them on this development program. It lasts for six months. There's a 15,000 euro stipend, which is tax free. 
Uh, there's don't have to be in the college now. No, no. Yeah, yeah. You you only come to the college for uh, for for the sessions, for the work workshops, or to utilise the facilities or the desks that are there. And so we we do 150 of those a year, and we've been doing that, uh, good lord, uh, for the last 15 years. So we're looking at thousands of, of entrepreneurs uh, starting, uh, failing, regrouping all of that kind of thing. So it's huge learning for us and for them in that kind of a process. And that's really early stage. I mean, some of these people wouldn't have a company yeah. set up when we okay. take them on. Would you, can I put you on the spot, would you have a favourite, would you have a memory of a particular company that started off within Enterprise Ireland on one of those No Frontiers programmes? Well, I remember a company called Abtran started down in Cork in the Genesis programme. Yes. Uh, Abtran have outgrown uh, the skills supply in Cork City. They have more than 2,000 people down there. They have set up a new unit in Sligo, uh, 350 jobs. They started on that program. Uh, you know, come in, a couple of guys talking about weird and wonderful stuff yeah. uh, and struggle and struggle and struggle down through the years uh, to actually generate something. Uh, some of the High tech companies, I mean, Iona uh, would have been oh, right. one of the early investments from Enterprise Ireland. Uh, so we would have invested in Iona when it was Chris Horn and a couple of lads yes. doing a European research project down in some sheds in the back of Trinity College. Um, we would have invested in the very early days in a company called Movidius. Yes. Movidius was the first um, unicorn company in Ireland with a billion dollar valuation. Uh, so, and, and, and you know, so there's loads of these companies that are that started as uh, people who walked in the door, and you wouldn't believe how bad somebody, some of them were at, uh, pitching their idea. They were nervous. They were, uh, you know, they didn't have all the answers. They weren't able to answer the questions, and yet you turn around and you see them today and they're a billion dollar company and they're working in a strategic partnership with Google and that kind of stuff. That kind of transition doesn't happen overnight. It's a long time coming. It's 15, 20 years kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, that's where we're going to find the companies, the big companies of tomorrow is, is that in very, very early stage. We actually love the really, really early stage. Enterprise Ireland would be the biggest seed investor in Europe. And we're the third biggest seed investor in companies in a global sense. Um, so that means we put early money into a lot of these. And in many cases, we don't put enough in. Yeah. And in many cases, we, we miss ones. We well, you miss good ones. Michael. You know, it's, well, yeah, you know. but it, it's tough like, uh, because we're not entrepreneurs. But so we're trying to assess. But the entrepreneurs coming to you have to sing for their supper. They, have they to, do. They have to make they the do. pitch in the sale. They do. They do. No matter how raw they are. Yeah. 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 So that. Pitching your idea is one of the key skills that entrepreneurs have and it, at its best it's about telling a story about a customer who values a solution to a problem that's driving him demented and he's willing to pay top dollar for it. Solutions that's a pitch. <laughs> now, who have we got here? They've surely got a question out here in the audience. Who have we got? Hands up. Someone in the school. Imagine you go to this man here with the glasses and you're going to get money and you're going to be a multinational in five years' time, ten years' time. Uh, we had the, the, the two Madden sisters here last year who are still in sec no, uh, one's in secondary school and the other one's I think is in Trinity. And they travel on the bus, they run their business from their iPads and from their smartphones in the bus going to school. They do their school and on the way home again they're collecting the orders, they're in touch with their salespeople who are selling all around the world. And they're in college and they're in school, so it's down to you guys. Right, give us a question. Who's out there? Who wants to learn? These are rock stars now. You've got to make use of them. Oh, who we got? Over here. Yes, thank you. Hi, um, just my question is, Michael, um, just for the program, I suppose, is the entry mode just through pitching or what else is involved? Okay, so uh, the New Frontiers program as I say, it, run, it runs in each of the institutes of technology around the country uh, at different times of the year. Uh, generally, there's a, there's a pre-engagement phase 
the first phase, which is kind of at the weekends, and you come along and you kind of suss it out, and they, we suss you out, and all that kind of stuff. But the formal entry into the program, uh, the six month program, is by online application, which is then we select from that, and from that, then you come to an interview. And that interview is where you have to really stand up and um, explain what your concept is and answer the questions as best you can. So in, a, in Athlone, for example, where I live, uh, in the Athlone Institute of Technology, we take 14 on. We've just taken on another 14 this year. And they're very early. They're really like um, the way you feel yourself when you're thinking about a business idea. You're not sure of an awful lot of things. But the idea is, is that if you can get into that support of cocoon, uh, the, and a mentorship that will help you to develop. That's the critical thing. But yeah, it's online and an interview. Thank you. Let's, ha let's have another question. Anyone from over this side? Don't let us down. Oh, another one here. Hi, can I just ask the entrepreneurs on the panel, um, how do you deal with rejection? How do you not take it personally? Good question. I get, I get rejected all the time when I'm pitching. <laughs> all the time. Would you, how would you say 60, 70% rejection? Would you um, give a percentage and how much? Yeah, maybe half and half. Half and half, yeah. That's tough going, guys. John? John? Yeah? Uh, um, can, can you, do you take it personally? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you I want to talk to them. Everyone says not to take it personally, but sure you do. Yeah. And then you have to go and uh, brush yourself off and uh, get on with it. Yeah. So it's all right saying, but uh, you own a business and so, someone says, I, I don't like what you do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and don't worry, don't take it personally. And you kind of go, yeah, okay. Make your pitch. What are you selling? <clears throat> I'm a retired teacher. I work for a multi level marketing company called. I've given you a minute. Synergy Worldwide. I could change the health of the nation with my products. I have amazing products to reset the gut, the microbiome. In UCC and Cork, they set up the Institute of Microbiome. They have proven that the imbalance of the gut bacteria is causing most illness. We have ProRG, which helps. Uh, cardio, 48% of people die of cardio. So our products can change the health of the nation, but I just tell people one at a time about the products. That's your reward now for asking a question. Well done. I need one, one more question. Anyone else? Down the back, and I have another one over here on the left then. Sorry, um, I'm just going to put the question to maybe Michael or David, just being entrepreneurs. I'm Mary Flynn and I'm with the Patents Office based in Kilkenny. We register into our, your protect your intellectual property rights. And just as business people, intellectual property rights, your patents, your trademarks, they're fundamental to any business. So how have you considered intellectual property, you know, as a new business? And even have you experienced any difficulties with people copying your trademarks or infringing on your patents? Massive problem today, pirating, stealing people's ideas, stealing people's products and their names, all this IP lark. Have you come across that, David? Yeah, for sure. Um, you, are you protected? Well, we, we, I suppose we develop software and we build protections into the software so it can't be copied. But it's funny because we don't have any, we, we haven't put any patents in place, we haven't put any official structures in place to protect what we do. But there are arms of the state that we have spoken to who have said that the only way we can do work with them is if we hand over the IP to them, which is... Uh, That's added value though. Can you throw, throw on those people, throw on those zero onto the, onto the, onto the, onto the invoice? If we could, we would, but uh, unfortunately we couldn't. So we, 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 we respectfully, respectfully uh, declined yeah. their offer and, and left the room. We actually got the order anyway. We just didn't, uh, we, we yeah. didn't give them everything that they wanted, but it's... Um, Look, it's, it's, a, it's a process, I guess. We're at a phase in our growth now where as we move forward and we develop additional products, we do need to start looking at, uh, at securing the IP. Okay. And John, is IP a huge part of your business? Um, different brands, you different products? Yes, IP is important, but not, not necessarily registering it. Okay. Um, for us, the registering process is, is unfortunately is fraught with difficulty because 
to register your IP, you need to write it down. Um, and therefore, um, we're in the food business mainly, and food business can be copied easily. Okay. Um, and once you have somebody's registered um, uh, formulation, it's very easy to make one um, slightly different that doesn't uh, impinge on, on, on you know, on, on the IP. So the biggest IP we have is, is what is the know-how we have. Okay. And to be honest with you, uh, most food is easy copied. Uh, so, so we don't bother. We do use trademarks uh, for brands, uh, but we, we tend not to worry about IP. So really, if you're not worried about IP, it's really up to you. To, you're upselling your benefits, really. That's why you're better than the crowd who try to copy it. Yeah. yeah. We're moving all the time. So for us, it's about continuous reinvention. So okay. it's always changing. You never, you never, you never stand still. Uh, person over here on the, the right wing over here, the last question. Lady with the glasses there, yeah. Hi, this question is for David. How easy is it to attract talent up in Meath? And I'm thinking in particular about shh, software shh, developers, shh. Um, software engineers. It's not easy. Um, I spoke to the people who run the software development course in IT Blanchardstown, they had graduation last week from the last cohort that went through and they have 100% employment. Um, I, I find that with Limerick Institute of Technology as well, it's, it's very, very difficult for us to get students out of the colleges. They all want to, to, to go and work for the, 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 well not all of them, but people want to go work for the multinational and that's important. I think it's very important. I think it's a it's a great opportunity as well for students to go in and learn skills and, and, and about process and learn how larger companies work. Where we've found um, the average age of employee in our company is quite high, um, but we we take in we take people in from industry who have experience. It's a little bit easier also for for us to manage uh, experienced people because we know that we can let them out uh, to visit the customer. We're not worried about what they're going to say to the customer. Um, so to answer your question in relation to how, how easy or difficult, it's not easy. It's, uh, we're hoping that, uh, we're hoping that as, as, as the tech hub in Kells grows and more people come in, it, it, it just, it, hopefully it'll start to grow and as, as, as companies do become established in there, there will be more people arriving at the doorstep, see what goes on in there and Hopefully, we'll start to uh, we'll start to see a, an increase in people dropping in CVs. Or, but as it stands at the moment, we've got to go out and look for them. We've got to go out and look for the specific talents, and it's it, it's not that straightforward. Thank you. And I think we have one more question before we break up. Thanks to that, talent is always a problem, isn't it? It's it's uh, that competition where we're approaching full employment, so it is a challenge. Yeah. And we person over here next. Hi, Sinead Cavanagh from Cyclistic Living Ireland. Um, the topic this week um, has come up of self-sabotage. Um, I've had a number of conversations during the course of uh, the BNI Royal Network and uh, uh, Meath Enterprise Tech Hub Expo on Monday. Um, for those late arrivals to entrepreneurship, um, uh, many people have come up with the, uh, or have agreed with the, the fact that they have self-sabotaged in the past. And I'm wondering for those of you who are entrepreneurs on the panel, is that something that you have experienced, personal experience of, or perhaps have experienced in your employees that you've seen it and witnessed it? Can I ask you about self-sabotage and what do you mean by that? Self-sabotage, that you have the skills and you have the abilities and capability yeah. and competence to be able to achieve what it is you want to achieve, but for whatever reasons, be they personal, emotional, professional, or otherwise, Insecurity. you yeah. stick your foot okay. in your way and trip yourself up, yeah. and almost for fear of the success that might occur. And I'm wondering if you, the panel have experience of it from a personal point of view, or perhaps have seen it in their employees, and how they've managed to overcome it themselves or encouraged others to rather than try and um, eradicate it, but to embrace it. You must take that, Michael. We see this uh, quite a bit, um, and it, the way it kind of manifests itself is that uh, people are very reticent to be open uh, about their product 
about their ambition, about what their ultimate motivation for starting a company is. And so they, they, they're kind of very reluctant to get involved in networking. Mm. And so, and we're pushing them to sort of, we think you should talk to this guy and that girl or whatever, you know, and sort of get advice and guidance and all that. And a lot of it is tough. It's tough love. It's kind of really hard kind of stuff to take on. And it means that you have to change your mindset yourself. And some people find that very difficult. And uh, they tend, no matter how often we would recommend them to be open about their product and about what they can do and all of that kind of stuff, um, they tend to keep things very, very tight to themselves. And what that actually does is it, it excludes that customer engagement piece and so it's actually, um, they're actually working against their own company, really, when they're taking that kind of an attitude. Uh, you know, we don't see it with everybody, but you do see it, um, particularly in the very early stages. Uh, people think, um, I've waited 10 years, 20 years to have a good idea, and now that I've had a good idea, I'm not telling anybody about it because I'm afraid that they're going to uh, swipe it from me. And John's right, there are people out there who are actually looking around and trying to, to, to snatch stuff, but um, there are a, vast, a huge number of individuals, um, <coughs> the likes of which end up in organizations like EO, who are there with the right attitude to give the advice uh, the, in the best possible way to help people to kind of move and progress. Research and research. You've got to make that, you, entrepreneurship is not about being behind the screen. It's about being front and center, standing up bald headed in, in sessions like this and talking about your product and convincing people that you can deliver. But when it comes down to it, you have to take the step though. Don't you, you have to take the step. John, can I, can I just add like, just to, uh, I recognize uh, the fear. Uh, so uh, fear is normal, um, and when you want to push out a business on your own, it's going to be multiplied by about 10. Um, it will mean that you probably won't sleep, and you probably won't eat, and you probably won't be a normal person for quite a long time. Uh, but actually, that's what you're signing up for. Um, it's not easy. Um, you are going to push yourself right about the cracking point, and some people push themselves right over cracking point. So, this is stress that you're going to sign up for, uh, pushing yourself into the unknown, uh, getting out of your comfort zone, uh, that this is where you're going. Um, it's not for everybody, and not everybody succeeds. A lot of people do talk themselves out of it when they shouldn't, but then the other thing to recognize as well is that, you know, they talk about A, Bs, and Cs in terms of skill sets, you know, the people who are super, super duper, this, that, and the other. I class myself as a C, um, but I recognize A's. So I, I surround myself with people who are far better than me. But one of, one of my skill sets is the soft skills. I know how to uh, recognize it. I know where I'm weak, and I kind of accept that, uh, and stop trying to be excellent at stuff that I'm absolutely brutal at. Because that's, that's a, a big recipe for stress that will kill you. But the, the fear factor um, is important. One is to say that if you're feeling that fear, uh, yeah, okay, that's normal. I don't know anyone that would start a business without sleepless nights. Okay, good answer. I hope that's, that helps you. Thank you. Rather than even getting as far as the product, but to get over the personal barrier that they create for themselves, um, in from the personal and then into their professional life. So even before they get the product to releasing that idea, it's to get the idea that they themselves have the ability um, and pushing themselves past that fear. So thank you very much, Mel. Thank you too. Um, is Councillor Tom Kelly in the room? If he can make his way up to the, the podium here before we wrap up, and uh, while. If he's on the way, I think we've, yes, this lady here, and we'll definitely wrap up after that. How are you? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Harifa Deli, and I just want to ask, what advice would you give a woman like me who's coming from ethnic minority background here in Ireland? I work, um, I do a lot of media, and I find it very challenging, like, um, 
to break through into Irish media because of where I come from in my background as well, which I love what I do. And I, I know I try and I do it well, and I've interviewed a lot of uh, politicians here as well. So what encouragement and advice would you advise a woman like me? And what are you doing in media? What's, what is your business? Um, I do media, I do interviews, a talk show, and I'm a writer as well. Okay. So I just write and publish my Facebook there. Okay. Yes. Anyone in there? Yeah. Paul? Um, well, I suppose first and foremost, you need to get your name out, you need to get your product out, your business idea out. Um, definitely the Chamber can help there in terms of um, connecting you to other businesses within our network uh, across the county of Meath. But, and also lots of networking opportunities. But secondly, we have a very active and successful um, women in business network, um, which we partner with um, the LEO in Meath. And we have uh, a number of women in business events and a number of breakaway break or mid-women in business meetups. So um, might be something of interest. There are definitely other people operating in your sector. Um, so I would, I'd, I'd advise first and foremost, that in order to get your name out, you need to get out and to get to meeting people and cross people in your own industry and then the people who might avail of that. That's, from, for, I suppose, first and foremost from, from, from a Chamber's perspective. What, what I would say too, because I know the area very well, it's an area I'm working in, um, you can't just expect to rock on up and, and get meetings and get to know people. You've got to have something to offer. You know, so what messaging are you bringing that's different to everybody else? What makes you unique? What can you bring to the party? So it's, it's about when you're selling yourself, I always say, what are the top three things? What are the top three bullet points you would bring to any discussion? So do you go on up to, to a producer in News Talk or in RTE? How are you different? Why are you different? What are the three things you're going to say? Because sometimes you might only get a minute and a half to make your pitch. Because I, I talk to media every day. And uh, most media are getting, I know for instance, the Irish Independent would probably get four to 5,000 emails per day and they have to make a, a newspaper out of that. It's the same for every producer in every uh, news program, every TV program, all the online forums, like in, in Maximum Media. So make yourself different, make yourself stand out, and make sure you have a really good headline which grabs their attention if you're sending an email because a lot of them won't take phone calls, they're just too busy. So you, you gotta be able to sell, it's just like selling a car. What's different, what's amazing about this baby, why is it gonna make a role? and you, you'll get yourself up there. But yes, there are barriers, but everybody has those barriers, you know, so we've got to work on your messaging. And you've got to work on those unique points that make you different, to make you sell. Thank you very much, okay. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Now, before we finish off, uh, in order to wrap up this session,